My name is Alex Kazan, and I'm the events coordinator here at the Clearwater Historical Society. Today we will be having Robert Scott Anderson, and he will be speaking about Florida and the Civil War. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you. Um, I've been a Civil War reenactor for about 40 years now. I've uh, got interested in the Civil War uh, about that time. 1983 was really the big breakout thing. Um, it started, I've been to a lot of the big battles that they did to, uh, for the centennials, or not centennials, uh, 125th anniversaries. Uh, was in Gettysburg. Uh, for the 125th, 35th, 45th, 50th. Uh, I've been doing these programs for public schools until they clamp down on the muskets and stuff uh, for years. My daughter got me doing that when I was her history project at Dunning uh, <laughs> Junior High School. Well, anyway, uh, I'm also the curator of the Safety Harbor Museum. Y'all need to come out here and visit us. But anyway, uh, one of the things that I find very interesting is the individuals, the Civil War and the hardships. Right here in this area, we had Captain James P. McMullen who formed what was called the Clear Water Harbor Guard. The reason I said it that way, Clear Water, was because Clear Water was not one word. That didn't happen until somewhere before the turn of the century. Uh, and we're talking about the quality of the water, not the town, because there really was no town. Uh, Fort Harrison was actually a rest and, re re rest and re recuperation, thank you, uh, location from the Seminole Indian Wars. The uh, other group that was formed in Pinellas County was called Abel Miranda's Coast Guard. Abel Miranda was blamed for the ambush and killing of Scott and John Whitehurst. He finally settled down around Maximo Point. But anyway, uh, he was a thorn in the Union Navy side throughout the whole war. His unit didn't last long, as neither did uh, Captain McMullen's. It was just uh, briefly a brief unit, a few months. It was disbanded. Uh, according to Florida State Archives, and all the research I've done, Captain McMullen then became a private in the 10th Cavalry, but he was detached, permanently driving beef uh, for the uh, Confederate armies. Um, I've got a lot of his pay slips from the Florida archives, uh, but he was never present because he was on the categorized. Well, anyway, uh, I can't find any reference that he was in any of the uh, battles with the Cal Calvary or anything, but he probably might have been. Uh, well, when they first, uh, January 10th, 1861, when Flora first succeeded from the Union, uh, there was rejoicing. Uh, there was things like uh, the Okawaha Rangers. Uh, they put up a big, uh, the courthouse, they put up a big uh, flag. It had all blue, one blue, uh, one white star, and had the words below it, let us alone. <laughs> but anyway, Florida had only been a state for 15 years. So it uh, really wasn't pulling out. Slavery was up in the northern part of the state. It was very, very little down in the southern part of the state, or what was called Middle Florida. Uh, Extreme south, other than the Keys, and around Fort Myers, there wasn't much of anything else. Well, all these units were being formed all the way across Florida. Uh, they all had these big fierce names, uh, the Rangers and the Guards and all this other good stuff. They all had one big problem. They had to outfit their troops, and this went across the country. I am dressed as a Union soldier, and the reason I am dressed as a Union soldier today is my Confederate uniform, due to illness, and I put on a little weight, and it didn't fit. <laughs> uh, but however, as reenactors, we portray both sides. Anyway, uh, what it amounted to was the fact that they had a problem with that. Some of the people here in Florida 
you had grown up and shoes weren't a major thing. They had to outfit them with shoes and uniform. The standard issue for both sides now was regulation, Kersey blue trousers. They're, they're button front, held up by suspenders. Belt loops didn't really come in for holding pants up until about the 1870s. Uh, same way with the uh, rear pockets. They appeared in the first clothing I can find rear pockets on uh, men's pants is in 1872. Well, what it amounted to was the fact that soldiers were issued one pair of breeches, a pair of braces, which are suspenders. They were issued one jacket. They were issued two shirts, which was usually unbleached muslin, cotton. They were uh, issued one pair of drawers, which were usually full length or ankle length drawers, underwear, uh, and pairs of wool socks. They were issued either a bummer uh, or a kepi. Uh, your kepi is your really short one. Your uh, bummers are like, I treasure this one, this was when I was an artillery commander, are like this. But they were patterned after the French hats that stood up. In this country, we never used the cardboard or the liner to keep them up other than some of the militia companies. Then they had to be issued equipment. Currently, I am dressed as a lieutenant of infantry. Uh, I would have a pistol, a belt. I would have a cap pouch. Lieutenants often carried a musket. By the way, this is a real one. This is a Springfield rifle. It is uh, Mark Trenton, which stood for the Trenton Locomotive and Machine Company. It was one of 13 contractors for the Springfield rifle during the Civil War. It's dated uh, 1863. The rifle and the bayonet are 100% real. <clears throat> Some of this other stuff I have on the table is real, but the majority of it, when I got sick, I sold most of my original stuff because I didn't think I was going to survive the cancer. But anyway, uh, we took and uh, had all their equipment. Well, the infantry soldier was a little different. And it'll just take me a second here to switch this. The infantry soldier would have been issued a lot of different equipment. First off, he would be issued a cartridge box. This is a really nice one. <laughs> anyway, the cartridge box was always worn over the shoulder. You weren't allowed to be left-handed, by the way. <laughs> the same way when I went to school, you weren't allowed to be left-handed. Uh, they'd be issued a belt. And on that belt, they would have a cap pouch, which is for the uh, percussion caps, which ignite the powder in a musket, and it would go over as such. Often they had a gold breastplate with an eagle on it, but they disappeared real quick during the war because, boy, did that make a beautiful target. Uh, they'd be issued a canteen. Every single original canteen I've ever acquired over the years, and I've probably owned about 30 of them. In fact, there's one up in Tarpon Springs that had a piece of grape shot from a cannon embedded in it, and it was owned by Captain Hope, who's buried in uh, the Tarpon Springs Cemetery. But anyway, uh, the canteen always had a knot in it. The reason being, and I found out the hard way, was to hoist it up. Your canteen, you want it here, not down here. When it weighs about three and a half pounds and you run and it swings around. Oh. <laughs> I found out the hard way, but it a cannon when it swung around. I'm in front of the cannon doing this. <laughs> uh, well, they also carried what was called a haversack. 
Sometimes, like the Union Army had ones that were tarred, which basically was a black paint that they put on it, kept it somewhat waterproof. Confederate Army and a lot of the Union uh, just had a canvas haversack. I always said lucky soldiers had two. Ah, uh, now I'll get to that later. But they carried their own sleeping quarters, which would be tied around here as such. Now, in this, that extra shirt would be rolled up, the extra pair of drawers, an extra pair of socks, and a lot of personal equipment. But the reason a second haversack would be popular is the fact the way rations were issued. Rations for the soldiers usually would be either pork or beef. It would have to be heavily salted and or cooked prior to the march. Rarely was it ever issued to you cooked. It was your idea, your way of keeping it. Uh, more soldiers died from diseases brought on by bad food than ever came close to. Uh, by bullets. The haversack, they might be issued molasses, uh, they might be issued uh, uh, pork, beef, it would have to be salted. Uh, the Union Army had what they called desecrated vegetables. Uh, actually, it was uh, dried out. And you'd add water to it and work. Uh, they had a lot of different things that the Southern Army didn't have. But one of the staples of both sides was a product called hardtack. Now this one is commercially made by a company called Mechanical Baking Company. Uh, it's out of Illinois, if they're still in existence. Uh, it doesn't spoil. I've owned this for about 10 years. <laughs> and what's interesting is this piece. Hard as a rock. It's edible. And this is one that I baked on May 5th, 1983. Wow. And uh, I did a whole bunch of them. I'm down to two pieces of this left. And you can see during the school programs, I nibble them. <laughs> uh, I have another whole bag of stuff that was done in 1988. But it's like cement. Yeah, you break your teeth. <coughs> Items that the soldiers would carry, and one of the things you had to be with, with your medical exam to become a soldier, you had to have two teeth. And they had to line up, upper and lower, and I'll explain later why. But a toothbrush, see the bristles in this? Uh, you can see the uh, lines in it. That's because it's pigtail woven into a bone handle. By the way, this is real, and it does have a hole in it because what I mentioned about pockets was often wore around the neck. Union Army got this, but I've been doing this program for well over 30 years, and no one has ever guessed what this was, so I don't even ask anymore. This is the way tea was issued to some of the troops, if they got it. It came in a brick. It looked like a Hershey's uh, candy bar with the little sections. It'd be broken. You would take your knife, carve some into your cup, and boil it. Um, every soldier would carry this. I don't know what they call it in the military, but when I was in the military in 71 through 73, we still called it the housewife. It's a sewing kit. Uh -huh. Remember what I mentioned about pants being held up by suspenders? One of the things about clothing back then is if you wore, I'm going to use an example, a 34, your pants were always a 36. The reason being is if they're tight, you sit down, you see one button go this way and one go that way. <laughs> so you're running around holding your pants up. Uh -huh. So what it amounted to is they're very, very loose to allow the slide on the suspenders. 
And if it broke, mama wasn't there, and the company commander isn't going to sew your buttons. <laughs> so anyway, uh, other things that a soldier might carry would be writing material. Now, rich or people that were more well off could afford an ink pen, but improvised, and actually this one came from uh, Cedar Creek, uh, where uh, Cedar Creek Battlefield, where a Union uh, cavalry camp had been overrun. And what it amounts to is, and I believe what it was for, is they took a bullet and hammered it out, and it makes a great lead pencil. That's a true lead pencil. And I have taken a bullet in the past and hammered it out because that's what I thought this was when uh, it was acquired. Combs weren't very common. They're wood. Plastics really didn't exist. Goodyear rubber had only come out in 1848, and it wasn't very reliable. A good soldier would have a tin plate, and I'd eat meals for 30 years off this one. Uh, silverware. Forks had three prongs. You have to be careful not to stick yourself. Uh, but anyway, these soldiers all had the same equipment. Training was terrible. All the way up into the late stages of the war. The, uh, one of the things that's interesting, in certain uh, battles, uh, soldiers were totally not prepared. And we've all seen the movies where they come up and they charge and everything's in close quarters. A letter from the Battle of Alusty, which is 1864, from a gentleman from the 7th Connecticut, basically said, they opened fire us at 750 yards. These rifles, you can hit a target. <clears throat> I have hit a target at 500 yards from these things. So the idea of the old days of uh, John Wayne movies of charge, we're going to get them. Uh, those days were over. These battles were not fought very rarely hand to hand. They were fought at a distance. Uh, in fact, when you read about Fredericksburg in Virginia, they're talking about a line of Union dead, 40 rods out. But yet, when they talk about it, the muskets were in our face, the fire from the muskets were in our face. Well, 40 rods when you're shooting, it looks close. But, you know, actually, in fact, I think it was point three seven, point three, uh, no, point zero three seven percent of all wounds, according to the Army Surgeon General, during the Civil War were caused by edge weapons. That tells you something. Such a small percentage. Now, some of the things that were interesting was Florida came that close to being uh, the first uh, battle of the Civil War. Uh, the Union Navy had uh, abandoned the Pensacola Naval Station, basically, and moved out to Fort Pickens, which sits on Santa Rosa Island. The plan was to quickly take it. However, they procrastinated. Uh, other places, like Fort Clinch, you had one caretaker. Fort Brook was a good one. There was a caretaker at Fort Brook. That was it. And when Confederate forces went there, they you could just basically hand them the keys. Uh, Santa Rosa Island was actually the first major engagement in the state of Florida. It occurred on October 9, 1861. Uh, what it came up with was Braxton Bragg was in charge of the whole area. Uh, Brigadier General uh, Richard Anderson commanded the local troops. Well, the Union Navy had launched a sneak attack up the Pensacola, uh, Pensacola base and landed some sailors, overcome the uh, crew of a ship called the Judah, and they set the ship on fire. Well, this really torched the uh, Confederate command. So they planned the Battle of Santa Rosa. And as I said, on October 9, 1861, 
Brigadier General uh, Anderson loaded up somewhere between 11 and 1,200 troops and went out to uh, Santa Rosa Island. He separated the troops into a three-prong attack. And the plan was is to get up to the fort and quickly overcome it. The fort was never designed uh, to withhold a uh, land attack. It was designed for a naval attack, just like Fort Brook was. It was uh, for, uh, for a land attack because the Seminoles didn't have a navy. I mean, well, anyway, unless you want to call a uh, dugout a navy. Well, anyway, what it amounted to is the fact that, unfortunately, they ran into the 110th New York, which was camped outside the fort, commanded by uh, a man by the name of Wilson. And it was called Wilson Zouavs. They wore the flowery uniforms and everything. And they were from the dregs of New York society, the docks, etc. However, they were quickly overcome and totally chased back. They were routed. However, surprise was over. The fight went on. And you'll see why I say this was fought at a distance. This was also at 3.30 in the morning. Well, Confederate forces realizing they really didn't have a big chance of taking the fort, uh, decided to withdraw. Well, they started to withdraw. The Union forces chased them. Total casualties in that, as reported uh, by General Bragg, was 18 killed, 34 wounded, and 30 captured. He also reported that 11 of his wounded were executed by the Union troops. Whether or not that's true, who knows? Uh, the U.S. losses were 14 killed, 29 wounded, and 24 captured. One of those severely wounded in the face, or uh, severely wounded, was General uh, Anderson. Well, things got a little quiet here in Florida after that for a brief period of time. The blockade was starting to take effect, but the Union Navy didn't have enough ships to cover every harbor. Uh, Ultimately, they did shut down Tampa Bay. And you're, you're going to notice I'm talking more about the center of the state. Uh, I'm not going to get into Jacksonville, Battle of Palatka, or any of that over on the East Coast. I'm talking more of the center of the state to the southern part of our, the uh, West Coast. Uh, I would be dazed to get into all that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the next real thing that occurred around here was... Uh, in 1862, a Union schooner sailed into Tampa Bay and anchored off the coast of uh, Fort Brook. Now, Fort Brook is sort of a unique fort. It never had the walls, per se, like you picture like Fort Apache or some of these other forts. It was designed as refuge for the Seminole Indian War. Henry Gadsden had sailed into Tampa Bay, landed at what they now refer to as Gadsden's Point. <clears throat> Gadsden's Point in 1823. The fort was opened in 1824. They basically confiscated the land from a squatter. And I think that court battle went all the way into the 1980s over trying to get the land back. But they chose that site for the fort because there was already a cabin there and a lot of the ground had been cleared and they run the guy off. I believe that was a Hackney family. But anyway, uh, what happened was it was fine during the Seminole Indian War, but after the third Seminole Indian War, there was really no point for it. The water is too shallow for ships to actually come into that area and come up close. So during the Civil War, you're talking about an action that's occurring real close to a mile out, and it had to be at high tide. <laughs> well, anyway, what it amounted to is a schooner landed off, and a delegation was sent out demanding the fort surrender. Well, the commander of uh, Fort Brook at the time, which was uh, basically your home guard militia units, uh, loaded 18 people in a boat and rowed out there and, uh, because he said he didn't want them to set foot on Florida soil and told them to stick it. Basically, he said, surrender is not in our vocabulary, which always seems to be popular because that happened again. Well, anyway, uh, the Union ship 
basically sat there for a while and then left. Well, nothing occurred there again until 1863. In 1863, there was a man in command of the uh, There was a man in command of the fort, and he saw, I see, well, I, got, I got a few notes here, the Tacoma and the Adel, two Union ships anchored offshore. Well, they think they're going to have a big fight. Well, what they didn't know is they had landed Ballast Point. Ballast Point is in the area where Gandhi and Bayshore are right now, over in Tampa. And they had landed about a hundred sailors uh, and troops there, and they were marching out and around as to not to alert the Confederate forces. It was a 14-mile march up to the Hillsborough River to a thing called Jane's Shipyard. Uh, it's called Jane Street Shipyard, and I believe it's still in existence. It's over by Lowry Park Zoo. Well, anyway, what they did is they were after a couple blockade runners owned by John McKay. John McKay, his descendants, ended up being mayor of uh, Tampa. Also, uh, he was uh, one of the ones who was the Confederate Quartermaster General for the Middle Florida. Uh, John McKay owned two ships. They were called the Cape Dale and the Scottish Chief. Well, the Union Navy came there, and they had brought a couple longboats with them to cross the Hillsborough River where they're coming around to get to them. Well, because they were heavy and it was a 14-mile march, they had sort of given up on the boats about a mile back. Well, a smart uh, lieutenant, Union uh, lieutenant, called over a little skiff, took the guy prisoner, and rowed over there. Well, they burned the Cape Dale, the Scottish chieftain. There was another ship there called the Noya, which got away. Well, anyway, Confederate forces are now alerted. So what happens is the sailors are starting to march back, and the Cow Calvary and all these various uh, militia units start chasing them. Well, they caught them at Ballast Point, and there was a fight. And it was actually the first cavalry charge into the surf. Well, at Ballast Point, uh, there, it turned out that there wasn't a lot of casualties. If memory serves me correct, I think I wrote it down. Uh, there was another small skirmish. Uh, I don't think I wrote it down. I believe 12 Union troops were either killed, captured, or wounded, and five Confederates. Uh, but the Confederate forces were more or less chased back due to heavy fire from the uh, gunboats, which are firing 24-pound shells, which are like, like a big bowling ball. Well, what happened was is, uh, Fort Brook, in later years, was captured. But it was captured without firing a shot. Uh, they found out that there was only about 20 troops holding it. The Union. Uh, Forces. They landed uh, troops. They marched into uh, Fort Brook, ransacked what was called the city at the time, and uh, stole a few things. In fact, there's a story that there was a Masonic Lodge, and one of the Navy uh, high, higher uh, rank Navy officers found out that they'd stole the tools from the Masonic Lodge, and he threatened death to any sailor that he caught with him and they mysteriously got returned real quick. Uh, in other words, the Masonic thing really crossed over. Uh, another interesting thing about Fort Brooke. Fort Brooke was occupied by elements of the uh, United States Colored Troops after the war, which was like an insult to uh, you know, the Floridians, but that's what it was occupied for. And they weren't happy about it either, because they definitely were not welcome. Well, in 1885, the fort was decommissioned as a United States fort. And uh, in 1887, and a lot of people don't know this. In fact, I only learned this a couple years ago. 
Fort Brook was incorporated as a city. Not Tampa. It was a city called Fort Brook. I think there was 448 residents in the 1890 census. In 1907, the city uh, disbanded and were annexed into Tampa. But anyway, just a little trivia on Fort Brook. One of the fights uh, <clears throat> that occurred just days before the Battle of Alusby in 1864 was the occupation of Gainesville. What happened was is Truman Seymour marched his troops out, but it was a very, very slow march out of Jacksonville with the goal of burning the Suwannee River Bridge and capturing Tallahassee. Well, it was sort of slow. He was getting cold feet. He was sending mixed uh, dispatches to his commanding officers that, you know, he was worried about troops from Georgia and, oh my gosh, maybe I shouldn't do this. And then the next message would be, we're moving gun ho I mean, it was mixed messages being sent. Well, he uh, really influenced the Battle of uh, Olusti with this. Because what it was is the um, 7th New Hampshire had repeating rifles. In other words, they had a Sharps rifle or a Spencer rifle. And what he did is he turned around and took the 40th Massachusetts uh, infantry, which was mounted, it was mounted infantry, and gave all their defective Springfield rifles, single shot muzzle loaders, to the 7th New Hampshire. And the 40th. Uh, Mass got the better weapons. Well, they went down. They chased away a small Confederate detachment uh, that was at Gainesville and captured the city and stole a few things and everything else. That was the first time Gainesville was uh, um, occupied. Well, 40th Mass went up, and like all the other cavalry units at the Battle of Olusky, were about useless. In fact, the Confederate uh, Commander Calloway was court-martialed after the battle for his inactivity. But anyway, uh, that occurred in 1864, and that was right before the Battle of uh, Alusti, which was uh, on the 20th of February. Well, Gainesville was again hit. Well, we'll go into the Battle of Alusti. What I said about the rifles being switched, when the Union forces came down and they fanned out, they spotted some of the Confederates. In fact, the first spotting of a Confederate he was sitting on horseback on the railroad tracks. If you picture the state of Florida, and I always do this for the kids, here's the state of Florida. Alusky's right about in here. Anyway, the railroad tracks that ran across were here. In fact, the 6th Florida Battalion was actually south of the railroad tracks firing across. Well, he spotted this horseman, Confederate horseman on the railroad tracks, so they started deploying. Well, the Union Army, as they're advancing, they're deploying. You have the 7th uh, uh, New Hampshire on the flank. Then you had 8th uh, U.S. Colored Troops, uh, United States Colored Troops uh, there. Then you had the 7th Connecticut. You had the uh, 47th, 48th New York and then the 115th New York, and they formed a line. Well, as they're deploying, this is where the disasters occurred. The commander of the brigade that had the 8th U.S. colored, uh, the 7th Connecticut and 7th New Hampshire, gave an erroneous command. When they're deploying, he ordered them to form on the 8th Company. Well, that's about impossible. The way they were trying, guys would have been cross, crisscrossing all over the place. Realizing what they'd done, countermanded the order with the correct order. And there's an old saying, order, counter order, disorder. That's exactly what happened. What happened was General Finnegan, who was the Confederate overall commander, wasn't even on the battlefield. He was back, and they had dug a line of entrenchments between Ocean Pond 
in a swamp to force the Union to attack. He had pulled troops from uh, Georgia and, of course, a lot of Florida troops. Well, Union armies get sort of stifled, so as they're deploying in line of battle, not where he wants them, he sends uh, Coke, and I have trouble pronouncing the man's name, but C O Q U I T T. Coquette sent him forward. Uh, he was a brigadier general. And in fact, he was the only brigadier general on the Confederate side on the field. He started deploying his troops. And as the Union's deploying, they were being fed in the Confederate troops and always managed to overlap them. So in other words, you had one line here, here like this, his line was overlapping this way. Uh, the New York Brigade took somewhere around 1,500 casualties overall. They took the brunt of it. The 7th New Hampshire, with the defective weapons, uh, one company commander in a written report said 20 out of his 42 muskets were non-functional. Plus, the command had been given specifically to them for this disorder. They skedaddled, which is basically they, they left the field. That exposed the 8th U.S. Colored, who lost a number of color guards, and they actually put their flag on one of your guns shortly before it was captured, uh, and it was captured. They were chased completely out. The Union line started to collapse. This battle went on for five hours, but it started at 750 yards. Uh, it was a Union disaster. It was also the largest battle fought in the state of Florida. Both sides were about equal. They had about 5,000 troops each. Uh, the casualties, uh, total casualties uh, for the Union were approximately 1,860 uh, killed, captured, and wounded. Uh, also, the Union Confederate, uh, Finnegan estimated about 1,000, and that was what he said, 1,000. Now, there were some letters that survived. One was a, uh, a guy that wrote his wife, uh, a Florida soldier, wrote his wife, and he goes, uh, I am sitting here on a Yankee blanket, drinking from a Yankee canteen, and I am uh, writing this letter on Yankee paper with a Yankee pen. <laughs> uh, there is another story that I didn't really believe at first, but uh, I've seen it in too many uh, diaries. There was a black Confederate cook that went out on the battlefield, and one of the wounded soldiers from the 8th U.S. color, laying on the field, looked like he was dead. He went over, put his foot against it, started pulling the guy's boots off, and the guy goes, hey, I'm not dead. And he said, well, I'll make you that, and he gave him the head with a board. Uh, there's talk of the Georgia troops actually killed some of the uh, survivors, uh, wounded survivors from the 8th U.S. color and also from the 54th uh, Massachusetts. How many of you saw, saw the movie Glory? Okay, I was in that movie. The thing that was interesting about it is we did the filming also for the sequel. The sequel would have been when the 54th, which was their, the highlight of their career, they fought the rear guard action for the Battle of uh, Alusty, Florida. And it was filmed up here in Alusty, Florida on the battlefield. Uh, unfortunately, they never did a sequel on it. I guess it's not politically correct. But anyway, uh, the 54th at the Battle of Alusty, they had to fight the rear guard action. And one of the things they did is, when they got back to Jacksonville, a train that had been commandeered by the Union had broke down hauling the wounded back. They sent the 54th out there and harnessed the whole regiment, and they had to pull the engine and the uh, train with all the wounded on it back close to Jacksonville, 11 miles. Those trains are not light. But anyway, uh, that was a battle of the Lusky. The 
1864, uh, get my date right, September 27th, there was another attempt to capture Tallahassee. A gentleman by the name of uh, Osboth, A-S-B-O-T-H, uh, was in command over at the Pensacola Naval Yard. And he came up with this brilliant plan. He later denied this was the plan. But anyway, the plan was to land or march his troops across the panhandle, capture Tallahassee, and it was funny, somebody mentioned Thomasville in the last one, move up to Thomasville and free the, uh, the Union prisoners, which he didn't know that they'd already been moved. But anyway, the plan was to do that. Well, as they marched out with his command of about 700 uh, troops, along with a couple artillery pieces, which were sort of weird, because they belonged to the first Florida artillery, U.S. They were recruited in uh, Pensacola uh, from Unionists, and actually, they were described, there's very little written about it. It's very, very hard to find any information. But for a long period of time, we portrayed them at some of these Florida battles. And uh, so we did a lot of research, but there was one letter that really got me. A Union lieutenant described them as a bunch of nearly well scallywags and thieves, <laughs> no two speaking the same language, but fierce in combat. But anyway, they went uh, along with it. Well, Asbeth, as he approached Mariana, Florida, uh, which is along Interstate 10 there, anyway, he uh, split his column into two uh, columns. He knew he'd been spotted. He knew that they knew what was going on for the simple reason is he'd been shadowed by uh, some of these independent cavalry units and it allowed the Confederate commander, uh, Montgomery, uh, to uh, gather forces. He had convalescent soldiers. Uh, Mariana, Florida was also an area for because of the draft or the conscripts. It was a place where the conscripts were inducted into the army and sent to the various units. So there was a lot of conscripts there. You had the Home Guard, a bunch of independent cavalry units, which were pretty much in the state of Florida useless. Uh, and you had uh, the Home Guard, and last of all, some of the citizens that didn't want to see their town overrun. Well, they turned over all kinds of uh, wagons and set up barricades on some of the streets, and Osmond split his column and uh, started moving in. Well, battle plans on both sides went totally crazy. Osbeth, along with some of his higher commanding officers, led a charge. They rounded a corner and caught a full volley, almost point blank, uh, into the face of, uh, from the home guard. Osbeth was shot seriously in the face. He was disabled. I think his second in command was also severely wounded. Uh, However, they carried the position. Some of the Home Guard units, the Confederate units, were falling apart. They were falling back. Uh, some of the local citizens and some of the Home Guard and a few of the cavalry guys that couldn't get to their horses started taking pot shots at the Union from buildings, homes, streets, and they got into St. Luke's Church. Well, they were ordered to surrender in the church, and they were told, no, we won't. Well, they set the church on fire and shot them down as they come brought it out. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things where they claimed that there was this atrocity. However, there weren't that many. Another big battle fought. Small amount of casualties. Confederate losses were 10 killed, 16 wounded, and 54 captured. A lot of those captured were citizens, which were later released. Union losses on that. Uh, oh, by the way, Colonel Montgomery was also captured. The, uh, Confederate losses, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Union losses were six killed and ten wounded. Uh, I personally think they padded that uh, Union commander. He later padded that uh, count because you didn't want to make yourself look too bad. Uh, also, a lot of these wounded uh, later died. One of the things that I'm going to pass around, there is a 54 cal or 58 caliber musket round. 
54 caliber musket round, a Williams cleaning round. Every tenth round had this zinc disc on it, which would scrape the crud out of the barrel. Black powder is very nasty. This is from a Sharps or a Spencer 54 caliber, I'm not sure which. And this is what happens to a mini ball when it hits something. Wow. I'll pass those around. No, these are all ugly. What? They're all lead base. Yeah, they're all lead base, yes. Uh, all the ammunition back then was lead base. Yep. Anybody doesn't want to touch lead, mm -hmm. don't touch them. Anyway, uh, what it amounted to is the fact that uh, a lot of times they pad their casualty rates because if I led a charge and I lost a whole bunch of people, I didn't want to tell my commanding officer. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we'll write them up as deserters or something. Well, anyway, uh, next comes 1865. And this is sometimes referred to as the southernmost land battle fought during the Civil War. It was, uh, the fort is at the current site of the public library in Fort Myers. Now, the actual fort of Fort Myers was established during the Seminole Indian Wars. And it was abandoned when the war ended in 18, the third Seminole Indian War ended in 1858. Well, what happened was, in 1863, the Union decided to land there. And Florida, because of all the scrub beef, uh, it's estimated that the Union Navy and Union troops there stole about 4,000 head of cattle, which was supplying the sailors aboard ship, etc. Anyway, Confederates finally got tired of it and decided to do something about it. So. Let's see, I've got the list here. This was interesting. Uh, on February 20th, 1865, members of the Cow Cavalry, a battalion of state militia, uh, there's more there. State militia and the Cattle Guard Battalion with one piece of artillery headed down there from Fort Meade. Fort Meade is just south of Tampa. Surprised they didn't change the name during the Civil War, but they didn't. Anyway, uh, Fort Meade, and uh, they got down here. There's two stories on the Battle of Fort Myers, which are both interesting. I got in a big debate with the author, Keith Cole, who wrote the book, Florida in the Civil War. I got in a big discussion with him a couple weeks ago over this, and he likes the version where the Confederate forces got there but the pickets alerted the fort. I rather like the other version that some of the Confederate uh, officers uh, said, that what happened was is they got there early in the morning and captured most of the pickets, and the fort wasn't alerted, but the overall Confederate commander decided to send in a flag and demand surrender instead of hitting it in the dark which they overrun that for. I honestly believe that, because they weren't prepared for that. Well, what happened was, is the fact that your commander says, no. So he uh, prepared to fight. Well, Union troops had two artillery pieces, and it was the 110th New York again, and also the second Florida Cavalry dismounted, mounted, which is what I was going to get into, and the second U.S. Colored Troops. And what it amounted to is the second Florida Art, uh, Cavalry uh, U.S., there was two uh, cavalry units uh, raised for the Union in the state of Florida. And the thing that's interesting is the fact that only one company out of these two regiments were actually mounted. They were foot soldiers. But they were used quite a bit uh, also in the uh, Battle of St. Mark's uh, or uh, Natural Bridge. They were used quite heavily. Uh, I mean, they're floor boys do the area. Well, anyway, the Battle of Fort Myers started. They battled all day long and quit at dusk. The Confederate forces packed up and decided to leave. On the way back to Fort Meade, they lost their cannon in the swamp. 
Oh. The Union forces had stripped the area of beef. They were leaving anyway. So they, shortly after this uh, skirmish or this fight, they packed up and left anyway. Of course, everybody knew the war was bought over by then. Uh, what was interesting is that whole day long battle, total casualties reported was one black soldier killed. That's both sides, that's all they reported. Anyway, as we move on, the very last and the second largest battle in the state of Florida was at a place called Natural Bridge. It's up by St. Mark's. St. Mark's River comes in. There were two bridges plus the Natural Bridge. The Natural Bridge is exactly that. St. Mark's River runs, and then for about 100 yards, it drops underground and then reappears. And what it amounts to, it makes a natural bridge. Well, the Confederate uh, John Newton, I believe was his name, uh, was the Union commander who was out down at Key West, came up with this brilliant plan. We're going to land at St. Mark's, march north, we'll destroy the Swanee River Bridge, we'll destroy uh, the Capitol, and this will end Florida in the war. Okay, that was fine. He loaded up his troops, and once again we had the second, uh, second and 99th U.S. Colored Troops and the second Florida Cavalry U.S. Two howitzers, and they were manned by sailors. A howitzer is a cannon, by the way. Anyway, what it amounted to is they landed at St. Mark's. They originally planned on sailing up the river. Well, evidently the water was low. And the U.S. Navy ships couldn't get up there, so they had to land on the uh, coast. Well, as they marched in, guys were sent out to burn or to uh, capture the bridges. Well, when they got there, the bridges were burned. Well, in other words, uh, needless to say, they weren't going to cross that way. So, knowing of the natural bridge, they headed that way. Well, it was a race, you know. Uh, the Confederates got there first. And you've got 100 yards across, they set up a semicircle. Now, the troops that did that, the list typed is about this long of <laughs> the Confederate troops, including an estimated 20 students from the Florida Military College, which is now FSU. Uh, they had 20, approximately 20 cadets. Uh, in fact, there's even a song written about the cadets saving the day. But anyway, uh, they turned around and they set up this semicircle. It was independent companies uh, commanded by a bunch of people we never heard of uh, that basically rode around and drove everybody nuts and did nothing for the war effort. You had a lot of uh, conscripts, home guard, citizens from the area, uh, farmers and everything else that just didn't want the these Union troops take Tallahassee. Well, attack after attack totally failed. The Union was totally stopped from crossing. Now remember, I can kill you with that thing at 500 yards. <laughs> you ain't crossing that 100 yards, not on my watch. Well, anyway, uh, what happened was Newton finally accepted defeat, and they marched back to their ships and left. Uh, total casualties for the Union were actually fairly light. Uh, 21 killed, 89 wounded, and 38 captured. Of that, a lot of the wounded died and were actually left on the field. Uh, I think it totaled 189 uh, were the official records. Uh, Confederate casualties were 3 killed and 23 wounded. I mean, it was a major U, uh, Confederate victory, but it was too late because once Lee had surrendered, that pretty much brought it down to uh, the fact that they weren't going to do much, uh, much else. Now, post-war, General Breckinridge, he escaped from Florida. Judah Benjamin, who had been the Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of War, and, uh, I mean, man was really up there. Uh, he came to Florida, and he stayed at the Gamble Mansion. 
And this is a true story. There's a man by the name of Vinny Louisi who uh, runs the Dunedin uh, Museum. Well, Vinny and I are good friends. Uh, I used to work a lot with him before I got involved with the Safety Harbor Museum, so we're talking over 20 years ago. But anyway, uh, his research found out that uh, Judah Benjamin had given McKay, we're going to mention that name again, a sword. And he, he, and he went down there and looked at it. Sure enough, on the sword that they had, that they didn't know they, uh, was something that was presented, was the inscription to John McKay. It's been out of the Gamble Mansion once, and they loaned it to Vinny because of this. And one of the things that was interesting is we were driving around. The city made a plexiglass case that was bolted to the wall to hold this sword. Now, as a dealer in military arms, uh, I valued the sword at less than $600, except for the inscription on it, which makes it priceless. But, I mean, it was a cheap foreign-made sword, as far as I'm concerned. But it was interesting that Judah Benjamin presented this. Of course, uh, Judah Benjamin uh, went over to England and, sort of ironically, wrote a book on real estate that is still used to this day. But anyway, uh, Florida played a sort of a small role as far as the war, as far as battles. Now, the last count that I found, there was something like 273 engagements that were recorded. The Union Navy was constantly landing, like uh, Rocky Point, there was a salt works there. In 1865, Union Navy went up there and destroyed it. Uh, but all along the coast, uh, they were doing the salt, and in doing the salt, that preserved the meat. Uh, you could be exempted from military service if you could turn out so many bushels. Well, the Union Navy was trying to cut that down, just like they were trying to take the beef, because thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, head of cattle went up to uh, the armies from Florida once the Mississippi River was cut in 1863. One of the things that's also interesting is the fact that there was a thousand head of cattle it was actually diverted from the armies to Andersonville. How many people have relatives in Andersonville that that might have saved their lives? Because they were starving to death there, too. Of course, so were the guards. An awful lot of guards died there while they were doing duty there. And of course, I don't think Andersonville was as bad as some of the Union prisons, especially the one on Sandusky Island where you take guys with no jackets and put them out there on the Great Lakes during the winter. Uh, but anyway, has anybody got any questions on Florida and the Civil War or any of the equipment or arms or anything like that? I can try to answer anything. Yes, sir? I have a couple of questions. Uh, Eggmon Key. Did Eggmon Key was a coaling station. So, so did it have any role? Oh, yeah, yeah, it had a major role. It was a coaling station. It was also a... Uh, there was no battles fought there or anything like that. And of course, Fort Soto didn't exist. That was the Spanish-American War front. But anyway, uh, Egmont Key was sort of key in a couple of things, and I didn't include it because it, it, I'm more or less talking about the battles. But Egmont Key was a coaling station for the Union Navy. They also ran payroll out of there. But uh, Egmont Key was a coaling station. And I mentioned earlier about Abel Miranda ambushing the Whitehurst. The Whitehurst were Union collaborators. They were from Clearwater, by the way. Yeah. Whitehurst family's still around. But anyway, the Whitehurst, Scott and John were ambushed by Abel Miranda. The story goes that it was never proven that he did it, by the way. But uh, that he'd ambushed him and that uh, Scott was killed instantly and John was actually uh, severely wounded. And it made it to a skiff and put out to sea and a man by the name of Crane. Uh, found the skiff floating and took him to Egmont Key. And before John died, he made the Union commander promise to take care of his sons, which he did, and inducted them into the United States Navy. They were 10 and 12. Now, that is a story. How much of that is true, but that is a story about Egmont Key. Egmont Key also served another purpose. 
escaping contrabands, blacks uh, fleeing the Confederate States or their, uh, their, were also kept there mm -hmm. and then later transported out. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, Alex. What about uh, Fort Harrison? What role did that play? In None. Seven, none? Fort Harrison really wasn't anything. Fort Harrison was for the Seminole Indian Wars, mm -hmm. and it was a rest and recuperation. Basically, it was a hospital. It was sort of like Bay Pines. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as an active fort, see, we didn't have the Seminole Indians in uh, Pinellas, what we now call Pinellas County. Mm -hmm. um, the only reference I've ever found of Seminole Indians in uh, Pinellas County was after the Second Seminole Indian War at Alligator Lake. There's a mention of a Seminole family found hiding on the uh, mm -hmm. southwest corner of the lake and they were deported. But this was after the Third Seminole Indian War. Mm -hmm. And whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it, it's in one of the newspapers. Any more questions? But there's a lot of interesting history on, uh, on Florida. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, uh, Odette Philippi uh, fled and stayed up in the area around Brooksville during the war and his house was ransacked. Mm -hmm. I've heard rumors of that. And where the Safety Harbor Spa stands, I heard that the Union Navy actually used uh, some of that water for uh, filling the casks on the ships. Because they knew about it, because Bailey had bought it, when he, uh, he found out about it when he was over in Fort Brooke, and he bought the property from the U.S. government in 1855. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I don't know if I ran over or not. Yeah, yeah. I didn't do too bad. <laughs> <laughs> started on that and I got, uh, when the war first uh, started, army shoes were like these. All these little dots are wooden pegs. It puts it together with wooden pegs. And the army paid less than $2.75 for these. The uh, later war, sewing machines invented that. But anyway, they started sewing them like this pair. These are mine, by the way. <laughs> Came from Jarnigan, a company called Jarnigan. Quite welcome. Thank you.